Welcome to today's Lighting Talk session on optimization and system. Hope you enjoy the workshop so far. Uh, I'm Joan from the Federated Learning Team at Google, and I'll be the host for this session. Today, here in this session, we will have six great talks from Felix Yu, Simon Kiyoju, Tom Golston, Julia Dev Arkaya, Zach Charles, and Andrea Heberlin. Without further introduction, I will hand it over to Felix to on the first talk about positive labels. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Felix Yu. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to quickly walk you through this uh, work called Federated uh, Learning with Only Positive Labels and Federated Deep Retrieval. Uh, this is a joint work with Anki Rawat, Aditi Amayana, and Sanjeev Kumar, and we are all from Google. So here we are considering um, learning a speaker ID model. So this model is uh, uh, basically a typical uh, neural network based model. Uh, the input is X, which is some user wise segment. Uh, and we feed this X through a neural network. After that, we get the wise embedding. Uh, and then the last layer of the neural network is basically a classification layer. Uh, suppose we have 1 million users and the embedding dimension is 100, then this uh, layer is essentially a uh, 1 million by 100 matrix where each row of this matrix is a uh, user embedding. Uh, so here, no matter what uh, loss function you are going to use here, uh, the objective is to minimize the distance between the wise embedding and the positive user embedding and at the same time maximize the distance between the uh, wise embedding and all the negative user embeddings. Uh, so like typical loss functions are like contrastive loss or softmax uh, cross entropy loss. Uh, so in this work, we are interested in training this model using federated learning uh, in the sense that the data will stay on the clients. Uh, and in this setting, each user has access to only the positive data associated with one label. Uh, and in this case, this one label is simply its own user ID. Uh, so basically the settings like the users cannot share the voice uh, between them because the voice is, uh, voice is like uh, sensitive personal information. And here each, we also uh, have this uh, restriction that each user can only access uh, to its own user ID embedding in the last layer, because uh, if uh, if one user can access other uh, others user embedding, uh, it can uh, uh, he or she can use that user embedding to identify others, uh, and this uh, so so uh, the user embeddings are also sensitive. Uh, so the problem here is that if we use vanilla federated learning, then in each communication round. Uh, for each participating users, uh, it can only update um, the neural network model and the final user embedding based on only the so-called positive parts of the lo loss function. Basically, uh, it can only minimize the distance uh, between the voice uh, embedding and uh, the positive user embedding. So then uh, the problem here is that uh, uh, it's very easy to see that one trivial solution, if you only do the optimization with respect to the positive part, is that uh, the algorithm can easily end up with a trivial solution where all the user uh, ID embeddings and item embeddings will be the same. Uh, so in this case, you will have loss uh, zero, but obviously uh, classification does not work. Uh, so the uh, the work is about uh, solving this so-called label uh, collapsing uh, problem. So the idea of this work is basically uh, in each of the communication round, in addition to doing the federated averaging, we also do an optimization step on the server with respect to a geometric uh, regularizer to make sure that uh, you know the user embeddings are not collapsing into the same point. Uh, the idea of the regularizer is very simple. We just it just uh, encourages for any uh, so it, it's like if you randomly sample two user embeddings, we want the distance of them to be large. Uh, so we showed by experiment that uh, this improves over some baseline method, 
uh, such as simply using the randomized uh, user embeddings without optimization. And uh, um, the quality is also very close to the uh, Oracle baseline where we simply use uh, softmax or some other loss functions in the regular setting. Uh, so one extension of this work is that this can this algorithm can also be used in the so-called federated uh, deep retrieval setting. Uh, so here the setup is like we are uh, we are interested in training a query to document relevance model. Uh, so basically, uh, a typical setup is like we are training a two tower model. The query tower embeds some user query into some embedding space and the doc tower embeds a uh, document into the same embedding space. Uh, and then we use the dot product to measure the similarity between the query and the document. So typically this model is trained by using uh, user clicks. Basically we, uh, we collect the positive data as the clicked uh, query and document pairs. Uh, but here we are interested in the setting like uh, whether we can train such a model Without sending, without users sending the clicks uh, to the server, uh, so this is uh, like e uh, e uh, essentially the same setting as I uh, talk about. Um, okay, so that's it. Uh, we can. Uh, so, like, if there are some questions, uh, please uh, bring them up. Otherwise, I have prepared a few other, like, a few questions myself, and I can also talk about this. Thank you. Thanks, Felix. I did not see question on Dory yet, so. Okay, so maybe I can have a couple of minutes to uh, simply talk about some some points I didn't cover in uh, in this short presentation, and also uh, talk about some future works and open problems. Uh, so one thing what I didn't talk about is that uh, we also have some theory in this paper, basically showing that. Uh, the conventional loss function, in the conventional loss functions, you have a positive part and a negative part. Uh, so the theory is basically showing that uh, if you switch this loss function to only a positive parts, uh, part, plus this uh, geometric uh, regularization on the label embeddings, uh, these two loss functions are fairly close to each other, and that's the reason why it works. Uh, the other uh, thing to consider in practice is like, uh, in training user ID model or the deep retrieval model, we are typically dealing with the scenario where we have many, many labels, right? So the number of label is like the number of users or the number of uh, uh, documents or URLs. So then uh, a critical thing is to improve the stability of the model. Uh, so here, uh, many of these uh, negative mining, like, like um, uh, fast negative mining uh, method can be borrowed. And in particular, in this paper, we use this method called uh, stochastic negative mining uh, to improve the efficiency uh, of the proposed algorithm. Uh, so one open question here is like, although we have shown that uh, these two types of loss function are fairly similar, but uh, one open question is like whether there are some fundamental limits uh, in this setting in comparison with the regular learning setting where we have access to both positive labels and negative labels. Uh, and obviously, um, uh, this method, although uh, it's designed with uh, uh, user privacy in mind, like we are not sharing the user data with the server, but this method doesn't come naturally with a differential privacy guarantee. Uh, that's a one uh, future direction. And in some setting like federated deep retrieval, we might actually have small amount of negative labels on each client. Uh, so that's some setting we haven't considered in this paper. Uh, and obviously it'd be nice to extend this to train uh, personalized models with federated learning. Yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Felix. Well, Sammy is preparing for the next talk. I have a qu one question that in today's and yesterday's keynote talk, we talk a lot about tail users and the fairness. Do you think your work on this, like balancing labels can also be extended to work with fairness? Yeah, so definitely, I think these uh, are kind of uh, orthogonal, uh, uh, are kind of, this topic is kind of orthogonal to that. Uh, I think uh, by tweaking the loss function, we can kind of 
in, in some sense, make sure that it also works well for tail users. Um, yeah. OK. Thank you, Felix. And our Thank next you. one is Samin on um, fault tolerant federated heat and distributed learning. So uh, I'm going to go over uh, the beginning of the talk today, and then uh, depending on questions, I'll either go over the second half or uh, I guess, uh, or not. <clears throat> so this is work with colleagues at University of Illinois, uh, Song Xie, who's uh, graduating this year, and then Indy Gupta, who's a colleague on systems. Um, so uh, I think the big picture takeaway, uh, and uh, various speakers have alluded to this over the course of the meeting today and also yesterday, is that distributed training uh, is susceptible to new kinds of failures beyond some of the standard failure modes of standard uh, machine learning training. So uh, all the issues that can come up when you're training a machine learning model, in some ways get compounded uh, once you're training a machine learning model on lots of devices at the same time. So the simple, uh, somewhat predictable and managed thing, bit flip errors, hardware failures of various kinds, software failures like issues with labeling and the data you're actually training on, or uh, software errors that lead to uh, issues on the machine learning data that you're ingesting. Uh, communication failures are quite common. Uh, the originator's talk today talked about uh, dropped updates when you're communicating with the server. Um, there are also, if you like, unmodelable errors, errors that uh, are not in this list because we don't know what they are. So they are completely unanticipated, uh, but could end up affecting your training model. So one way to think about these things formally is to think about worst case errors. So these are known as uh, Byzantine attacks in the computer system literature, and they're a kind of serial attack. Uh, if you like uh, attack defense kind of work, you can think about this as a kind of attack defense. Even if you don't though, I think these are highly relevant because they point to uh, protection from worst case errors, which uh, in some sense automatically give you protection from unmodeled or unmodelable errors that could happen as you're training your distributed learning system. Um, as a very simple example in a sort of standard gradient descent type uh, model, you can imagine that uh, for some reason one of your gradient points in the wrong direction as you're training a distributed machine learning model. And this is a cartoon example, but it's clear that now your average gradient points in the exact wrong direction. And so you'll end up uh, converging to the wrong answer. So um, this talk covers both uh, distributed training using sort of uh, aggregated distributed, uh, so aggregation over uh, client gradients, which is common in of standard server settings. And you also will talk a bit about federated learning. I'll spend most of the time uh, on the first topic, and then uh, leave you to what to talk or ask questions to cover some of the second. So in uh, distributed uh, aggregation, you are computing gradients on the workers, and the threat is that there's some kind of that leads to a wrong gradient uh, before you aggregate. Um, there's a bunch of work in the literature that tries to address this. I think the most popular is uh, this uh, paper called Crumb, which comes up with a method to try and uh, uh, improve how uh, the robustness of the system by improving the robustness of the aggregation. So the idea is that I can aggregate with uh, better methods that will lead to better robustness overall. In particular, what they try to do is uh, they focus on norm guarantees on gradient aggregation. So uh, the idea is that I'm going to try and aggregate gradients such that G, which is my aggregated gradient estimate, estimate is close in Euclidean error to uh, the expected gradients over my model. What's interesting, and is maybe obvious after the fact, is that uh, robustly estimating the average is different from robustly optimizing a model. And in particular, you can construct attackers that are close in terms of average error, but actually point you in truly uh, sort of arbitrary directions. So you can completely uh, break a system while still looking fine with respect to this metric of being close in terms of average error. So uh, the important lesson from this is that if you're uh, training a machine learning model, what we really care about is learning convergence, not generic robustness. And in fact, even if all of the you, you satisfy all of the assumptions and you satisfy all the theory of 
lot of the existing robust training methods, things like Karma Median, you can still end up training a model uh, that can uh, be sensitive to different kinds of failures. So here are just some examples to highlight the point where um, various kinds of failures or attacks lead to catastrophic failure of the training, uh, both for crumb and for uh, median. And again, to highlight, all of these attacks satisfy all of the assumptions and all the proofs in the models that uh, exist. The main issue is that those proofs aren't addressing the real problem. They're addressing uh, average expected uh, gradient problem, not actually uh, addressing the optimization progress problem. Um, one way to address this is work that we recently proposed uh, that constructs a stochastic descent filter. The idea is to filter gradients that don't help and only keep the ones that do. And we can show both in terms of uh, optimization results and in sort of real world performance that this kind of approach works pretty well. Uh, it has good tolerance, so you, you're tolerant to lots of potential attacks and failures. Uh, but still is highly scalable and has good uh, computational complexity. And uh, I have some results here just showing how this works in practice. I'm going to move very far ahead to the final slide uh, to, for the key takeaways of the overall talk. So the first part, which is what I uh, overviewed very quickly, mostly talked about using uh, sort of uh, Stochastic aggregation, which we call a suspicion-based aggregation for distributed SGD and show how this can help for robustness to adversarial workers. And again, I want to highlight adversarial workers and also failures and come from different sources in a sort of distributed training uh, setting. And then uh, there's a second part that I didn't talk about as much, but uh, focuses on federal learning specifically, which behaves somewhat differently from distributed SGD, uh, but also where we have methods that uh, address some of what was have been talked about today, so robustness to non-ID data, communication failures, and adversarial devices. Um, and all of what I've talked about so far is covered in a few talks, um, sorry, a few papers. Uh, there's uh, Zeno, which is the, the um, robust aggregation, is an ICML here, and we have an update this year that allows you to train a synchronous using this same kind of uh, if, I guess a few weeks ago in ICML 2020. Um, and then uh, uh, failure cases highlighted in the UAI paper recently and so forth. So I'm going to stop now, I think, and uh, try to answer some questions. We have time for like one or two questions. I don't see a question on Dory. It, does anybody want to talk in this room? I'll ask one question then. We always worry that such like robust aggregation is not compatible with secure aggregation, such techniques we have at Google. What's your comments on that? I think that's a valid uh, issue. Um, we have work in progress where we think we can uh, deal with this problem. Uh, but I think that's valid. I think most of the current robust aggregation methods require nonlinear operations of some kind. So median, uh, like classic methods like median, or even uh, some of the methods that we've been proposing uh, require nonlinear operations, which are in principle computable with uh, privacy preserving methods, but also extremely expensive and still not scalable. Um, we are working on solutions, hopefully within the next few months. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have a, I don't know of an existing answer uh, mm -hmm. that sort of is compatible and sort of scalable, but we are, we have stuff in the pipeline that we hope will address this. Makes Good sense. question, thank you. Yeah, looking forward to the new secure aggregation, compatible with robots aggregation version. <laughs> And uh, I guess I can ask another question. It's like, it's sort of detail. If we do not have like malicious agent, uh, when we use such robust aggregation, we'll see, we will see a drop on the final performance. That's a great question. So in general, you do pay some costs. Uh, the cost in our experience is very low. Um, so in terms of accuracy, um, let's see if I have it on the slides, but it's order, uh, I guess a couple of points. Um, 
So yeah, I don't have it on these slides, but we have experiments checking this. Um, the, the cost you pay is very low um, if there are no attacks, so if you're using it in a benign setting. Um, the most recent methods that use filtering seem to not pay any cost. Um, so, but then you pay a bit of sort of extra computational overhead. But in our experience, they actually get you the same performance um, as you would have gotten uh, em empirically anyway. Convergence rates are similar, but we don't think those are tight. Uh, empirically, they seem to be uh, sort of very close. So it seems like you might be able to uh, sort of get close to what you would do in a benign setting. I should highlight though that the the cost of the filtering tech methods is uh, additional computation at the server and uh, also sort of additional information sources, which uh, creates a new trade-off, if you like, uh, that one has to balance with the other trade-offs. So there is some cost, but it seems to be really good in terms of performance. Sounds great. Thank you, Sammy. We'll talk yep. about this trade-off in the breakout session later. And uh, if you have time, you're welcome to join the discussion. And uh, for the next, let's welcome Tom. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work uh, we're doing in my lab on data set poisoning. So there's been a number of talks already on data set poisoning. And I think that means different things to different people. The set setting that I'm going to talk about is a slightly different threat model than you may have seen before. Uh, we are interested in what is called clean label poison attacks. Uh, clean level poison attacks means that you're going to add, uh, you're going to manipulate a training data set by making small perturbations uh, to training instances that are difficult uh, to discern. So for example, you might have images that are perturbed in a, in a way that makes it difficult to tell that they have been poisoned. And yet if you put them into a training data set, it allows an adversary to take control uh, of the resulting classifier. Now, this is a little bit different uh, than, for example, backdoor attacks. Uh, and there's been some talks on that already. Um, Vitaly uh, Shmarkov, who gave a keynote talk, and uh, Eugene Bagasarian, who I think is actually in this session, have worked a lot on, on backdoor attacks. And backdoor attacks is a little bit different in that you, you make modifications to both training uh, and test time data. So clean label uh, uh, poisoning is, is a threat model where you're only going to modify training time data. Uh, and we're going to make our attacks both clean label, so it's hard to tell that instances have been modified, and targeted, uh, meaning that we're only going to change test time performance on certain selected uh, instances. Right, so these, these two properties make it difficult to discern when, when a data set's been poisoned, but also it makes it easy for an outsider to execute poisoning uh, because, for example, if you're scraping data from the web or collecting from anonymous users, it's very easy for people to insert these kinds of poisons. So there's different ways to create poisons. Uh, one of the simplest ways is you do what's called a feature collision attack. So you start with a base instance, so to take this image of a frog, and I want to change the test time label of an airplane. And so what I do is I solve an optimization problem that, that finds an image that looks like a frog to you and me, so it's close to the frog in pixel space, but it collides with the airplane in feature space. It has the same feature representation as this airplane. And so you put this uh, training instance into the data set, and if you train a neural network on it, neural nets generally overfit, and so you learn that that feature representation corresponds to a frog because there's an image at that location that's labeled as a frog, and then when this airplane comes along at test time, it will be mislabeled. Uh, so here's just a simple example of that. This is using ImageNet. Uh, so we take this original image, which is unpoisoned, and I can create this poison image. And if I add just this one poisoned image to the training data set, then the image above it, which was classified as a fish originally, is now classified as a dog. And I can do that with this fish, and I can do it with all of these fish images and create different poisons. It's very difficult to discern that this image is poisoned, but just adding this one image to the training data set can change the test time behavior. And just to show you that we didn't cherry pick too badly, we can switch the roles and I can use these various poison fish to change the labels of these dogs. So our recent work is trying to push the limits of poisoning further. Um, we wanna be able to poison really complex end-to-end -end training pipelines we want to scale this up to see if it works on industrial systems. And we want to be able to accomplish a, a wide range of training object of, of uh, poison objectives. And one way to do that is using meta-learning. So we have this framework called MetaPoison. And basically, MetaPoison tries to directly attack the model training pipeline. So suppose that you have a bunch of data, and there's also some poisons floating around in your data set. When you train a neural network, you're going to form a mini batch by subsampling some images. And that subsample might contain some poisons. 
then you run it through a training algorithm. So you start with some parameters. Uh, you run something like an iteration of SGD, and you get these updated parameters, theta prime. And then the adversary, after running a, an iteration of the training procedure, measures an adversarial loss that says whether the adversary's objective uh, was satisfied. And then you backprop through the entire SGD training process and make a gradient update to that original poisoned image to, to lower the adversarial objective after the mini batch is used uh, uh, to update the network. Uh, so here's just some examples of poisons you can create this way. The first two columns here are poison dogs, and the second two columns are are uh, so the first two columns are on the on the left are clean images, and then the poison images are on the right. And it's very difficult to discern uh, when images have been poisoned by these sorts of methods. In this case, we can we can use these uh, poisons to train it, it to uh, switch the label of a bird to a dog according to a resin 18 classifier. Okay, so one of the questions uh, you might ask is, do these things work on realistic systems? And I think a common criticism is that they might not. Uh, but to demonstrate that they could work on realistic systems, we took a poison CIFAR data set, and we upload it to uh, Google's AutoML tool, and we can actually use it to change labels. So in this case, we took an 82% bird, and we switched it to being a 69% dog. Uh, our recent work that we have done is actually focused on uh, scaling this up to even bigger data sets. We actually have uh, some, some uh, work that's under review right now. Where we're able to do this with ImageNet. So we can actually poison one-tenth of 1% 1 of the images in ImageNet, and we can upload ImageNet to AutoML, uh, and we can actually pick and choose the labels that come out of, of the resulting classifier. Uh, one of my students, Avi Schwartzchild, is interested in measuring how effective poisoning methods are. And so I'll just mention he's created this data set poisoning benchmark where there's different benchmark tasks. Uh, and we measure the effectiveness of different kinds of methods on actually successfully poisoning uh, the training pipeline. All right. And I just want to say thanks to my students and my postdocs who have worked with me on this. I could not do any of this without them. And here is a list of uh, papers that I spoke about. Thanks, Tom. We don't have questions on Dory, so does anybody want to ask question now? Yeah, I, I do have a question. Sure. Hi, Tom. Yeah, nice talk. So I just want to uh, better understand the meta poison algorithm. So uh, in the equation you show the in the slide, this, uh, there's mm -hmm. a model parameter state and also the the data uh, the input data uh, based on fraud. So can you explain it a little bit more about uh, how? Did you connect the, the the poison type to a data with the model parameter? Yeah, sure. So what we do is we 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 take a big batch of training data. So you might take say ImageNet, and then we identify a small subset of images, right? So we might identify say a hundred images in the data set as poisons. So we want to train those images to be poisonous, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we just run a standard SGD training process for ImageNet, <laughs> and after every SGD update. We, you know, you update the model parameters to make the model perform better on your data. But then mm -hmm. after we do that update, we also do an adversarial update where we then update the poison images, which are a subset of the training images, in order to make the SGD training process uh, sort of go off course and, and end up with a strange result. Uh, I see, so I how do you define the adversarial uh, loss? Is it a same oh, loss? It can, be, it can actually, the nice thing about this, uh, so if you do something like feature collision attacks, then you, there's a very specific kind of attack you're doing. You're going to change a test time image to have the same label as a training image. In this mm -hmm. case, the adversarial loss can actually be anything. It's any loss that you want the SGD process uh, on it on on ImageNet to minimize. So okay. in other words, when you when when the victim runs SGD on ImageNet, just a standard SGD training process, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to minimizing the training loss, it will also minimize this adversarial loss inadvertently. And the adversarial loss can be anything. In this case, it measures the uh, the inverse cross entropy on a target image. So it's it's a loss that's small when the target image is classified wrong, and it's mm -hmm. large if it's classified correctly. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah, so the training algorithm here is just a standard SGD routine. And when you backprop through that, you're back to the images. You're trying to modify the images in such a way that when you run a standard SGD update using that mini batch, mm -hmm. in addition to minimizing the training loss, it will also minimize this adversarial objective. OK, I see. Thanks. Could I ask a quick question? I don't know if we're out of time. Yeah, oh, yeah, Jang, it's up to you. What do okay. we have time? Yeah, I mean, go ahead. OK, so Tom, um, could you say something about uh, uh, super, uh, great talk, by the way, uh, something about 
vulnerability. So which data points, uh, you talked about targeting, how easy are all points uh, sort of vulnerable in the same way? And maybe also uh, how many, um, how much poisoning do you need to do in order to successfully target a particular point? Right, so, uh, okay, so I'll talk about the first question uh, first. Uh, for feature collision attacks, there are, you know, data points that are near the decision boundary to begin with are easier to move, but not dramatically so. So in our in our Poison Frogs paper, we did a study of this and we found that points that are near the data boundary, it might take like 30% or so more poisons to successfully attack them. So they are more vulnerable, but not dramatically so. For meta poisoning though, that's for feature collisions. For meta poisoning, we have not observed a difference, any systemic differences between what images are easy and which ones are hard. You know, where images lie in feature space does not seem to affect how difficult it is to, to target them with a poison attack. Um, now, there may be other factors that affect the susceptibility of different uh, object classes, but we haven't been able to discover those. Um, and then the other question is, oh, so what was the second part of the question? Uh, you mentioned 30%. I was thinking about fractions. So how many points so do what, I need to okay, add? Okay, yeah, what fraction? So one of the, yeah, uh, so it turns out fraction is not a very good way to measure how many poisons you need because you could say there's the number it's more about the number of poisons you need and so you can make that fraction as low as you want just by taking a huge data set right so the experiments we've done on ImageNet um, on AutoML we can poison one tenth of one percent of the images and still pretty reliably change uh, the label of an image uh, through Google AutoML right now that's a total black box system I don't even know what what the training pipeline is, I don't even know what class of neural networks they're using. Uh, in the lab, we can, where we where we have more of a standard training pipeline we have access to, we can get away with even smaller training percentages uh, than that. Like we can do like one one hundredth of one percent and still get pretty consistent poisoning uh, behavior. Oh, sorry, what's that? You mentioned the numbers are more relevant than percentages. Sorry, guys, I don't want yeah. to cut off. Okay, yeah, we should probably finish okay. up. But yeah, I mean, for <laughs> on, on image yeah. we generally find that we need about 100 poison images to be reliable okay. uh, for a standard training pipeline. On an industrial system like Google AutoML, we need a little bit more than that because we really have no idea what's going on inside of that black box. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tom, again. And I guess you can you guys can talk offline. And uh, we do have a few Dory questions pop up. Well, Tom, if you have time, you can, uh, could you try to comment on Dory? And uh, next, let's welcome Jared there. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Jeng. Is my screen visible? Yeah, looks good. We okay. guys saw your screen. OK, now it's the slides. OK. Thank you. Perfect. OK. So this talk is uh, slightly different from the one that's uh, on um, on the pre-recorded talk, so which is good if you have watched it already, which I doubt anyone has, uh, you'll still not be bored. So this is a recent work that we published, uh, I guess, less than 10 days ago. So hopefully, it's interesting. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the organizers, Marco, Adria, Peter, Cheng, Renier, and uh, Jennifer for uh, organizing this wonderful workshop. And uh, this uh, is a joint work with uh, Clement Canon, is at IBM Research, Yuhan Liu and Zitang Sun, who are my students here at Cornell, and uh, Himanshu Tyagi, who's a long-term collaborator from Indian Institute of Science. And uh, let's dive right in. So we are looking at the task of uh, distributed inference. And uh, the goal is to solve some kind of inference task at a server given data from various users. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Yeah, you're audible. OK, OK. Uh, so in this scenario, what we want to look at is uh, there is data across many, many users. And uh, there is a central server that has access to only some constrained measurements of this data. So the setting that we are looking at is there is an unknown distribution P that we assume is a, a discrete distribution over a set of size K. And there are N IID draws from this distribution P 
that are distributed across these n users. So there are n users that are distributed in space, and each of them gets one draw from this distribution. And now here is the, the first abstraction that we have is the, imagine there is a set of allowed channels whose input set is the set of observations that these people have, okay? So what do we mean by that? So let's consider why we want to come up with this abstraction. So first let's consider the set of channels W subscript L, which is the set of all channels whose input is K, the underlying domain, and the output is L bit strings. So what does it mean? It means that you have communication constraints. You can only send L bit strings. And similarly, if you are interested in uh, local differential privacy, and instead of epsilon LDP, I'm writing rho LDP because epsilon is already taken. And uh, you can write uh, rho LDP as uh, the set of all channels where the output probability for a, uh, for a given output Y doesn't differ by more than e to the rho multiplicative factor across any two inputs. And you can model many different constraints, okay? So now what is it that we are trying to do? So what we are considering is the following setting. So you have a bunch of players and each player gets one sample from this distribution and the player I is going to now choose its own channel from this set of allowed channels. And once it chooses the channel, it's going to trans uh, pass its own input XI through this channel. And whatever is the output that comes out is the message that it sends. Okay. So now by this abstraction, we can consider uh, local differential privacy or communication constraints. All of them are just each of these users is selecting one of the allowed channels, passing their inputs through the channel and sending whatever it is the output to the server. So when we do this, all the problem boils down to how are these channels chosen? And that will give us give rise to, I guess, uh, one of the most important uh, concerns or uh, issues in uh, federated learning is how does interactivity work in, uh, or what role does interactivity play in these kind of distributed uh, settings? So first, let's look at uh, what kind of different ways people can choose these channels. Okay, so the first is, it is a private coin protocol in which each user just chooses its own channel, independent of what happens to everyone else. In the second case that we call as public coin protocols is basically the first, first the referee sends a random string to everyone. And now each of these players can choose their own channel that they want to use based on this random string. So now the, the channels are all synchronized. However, this is again a one round protocol, like there is no inter, uh, not many rounds of interactivity that is uh, happening. So if we want to make it a little more general, then we can look at what are called as interactive protocols, where the users are going to select their channels one at a time. So the first user will select its channel, find its message, send it to the server. The second user is now able to see what the message is and select its own channel based on this message and everything else that it knows and so on. So each user can look at all the previous messages and can select its channel. Now this can provide a lot of degree of flexibility. However, it can come up with problems of latency and so on. So this can be represented in this picture. So there is an underlying distribution P that generates these data points X1 through Xn. Player I is going to choose WI based on its uh, own randomness and all the previous messages that it has seen, okay? And then the server observes all of this and uh, tries to come up with uh, some kind of inference task it wants to solve. So what we can see is that clearly, public coin protocols are more powerful than private coin and interactive protocols can be more powerful than public coin. But now how do we study and what do we do with it? So we are going to look at some of the very most basic questions that are possible. So hopefully I can at least convey what are the questions. So since we are looking at discrete distributions, we look at two problems. The first is that the server wants to estimate the underlying distribution P hat in total variation distance, or it can also be thought as the L1 distance. Okay. And the other is it wants to do some kind of hypothesis testing. We look at the most simple hypothesis testing problem. It wants to know is the underlying distribution uniform or is it at some distance epsilon away from uniform? Okay. 
and the question we ask is how many users are needed to solve this problem okay and today we are going to only look at discrete distribution estimation okay and uh, where again remember that the goal is to estimate the distribution up to a total variation distance of epsilon okay and for this people know if you don't have any constraints you can get access to the exact samples x size then you can solve it with k over epsilon square samples this is a nice exercise uh, you can do it and now the question is what happens under the two constraints that we saw communication constraints and privacy constraints so if you look at the uh, communication constraints what we can show is there are private coin protocols like don't need any chancy protocols actually this is also a nice exercise you can solve this problem with a blow up of k over 2 to the l samples or number of users so in other words for example if l is log k then you have no blow up because you can transmit the exact symbol that you see so the exact sample can be transmitted with log k bits right so and if l is 1 then you have a blow up of k so if you can send only one bit you have a linear blow up or the quadratic blow up i would say in the sample complexity and similarly for uh, private protocols there has been a lot more work there are many many different algorithms that have been proposed starting with at least uh, two of these are uh, works uh, by groups at google the rapport paper and then there was uh, kairos uh, bonavitz ramaj and uh, there were many others that showed that for private there exist private coin protocols that again have this blow up of k over rho square and this is essentially you can say okay this is why ldp is bad and you have a blow up in uh, uh, sample complexity or a severe drop in utility so we want to ask are these bounds tight do we actually have to pay these uh pay this much more or not so turns out if we look at l bit communication it was shown by a couple of papers like han mukherjee osgood and weisman and a paper of mine with clema and dalman shu that for in non interactive protocols like private coin and public coin protocols yes these bounds are tight you can't do much better for local differential privacy also this was shown by a paper by duchi jordan wayne right and a paper by again in the same paper with clema and iman shu and also by a paper by minye and uh, sasha bag all showed that these bounds are tight but what about interactive protocols it turns out that uh, there were two papers that uh, claimed this uh, result that uh, interactivity does not help for uh, distribution estimation so for l1 distribution estimation and uh, one of them was this uh, paper by han mukherjee osgur and weisman and the other was the original paper of uh, duchi jordan and wayne right unfortunately both of these proofs are uh, flawed and are unable to account for interactivity so they do work when the protocols are uh, independent in other words you choose channels independently of each other but once you have interactivity there can be difficult kinds of correlations that can arise across the players and across the coordinates that can propagate and uh, these uh, uh, correlations or these dependencies that arise were ignored in uh, some steps of the papers of both of these papers which we point to in our draft and uh, what we show is the uh, so our results are basically a new method to prove lower bounds for uh, interactive uh, for inference uh, under uh, information constraints when you have uh, interactivity and uh, our results at least for communication and privacy what we do show is that for the task of estimating the distribution you do not gain anything so in fact their results were correct even though the proofs were wrong and um, for the task of uh, distribution testing what we show is uh, that uh, there could be nice gap between both private coin public coin and interaction there could be these uh, nice uh, trade offs that can happen so i think i have not defined most of these uh, notations except the communication and privacy one should be i guess so uh, at least the result should yeah be... i'm sorry to interrupt yes. here but we are yes. out on time okay. could you quickly summarize in one this minute is my, this is my last so we can move on thank you yes, this is my last slide yeah wait yeah this is my last slide so uh, what i want to finish off with is that uh, for the for the out of all of these results for the task of uh, testing distributions one of the uh, the results that was known before was the uh, 
problem of uh, testing under local differential privacy, which we also obtain as one of the results. And uh, one and uh, the there were two papers that got these results recently, and one of them was a paper again by researchers at Google. So Google has been doing a lot of work in this uh, basic uh, framework as well. Okay, I would like to stop here. Thank you. For the sake of time, let's move on to Zach's talk on adaptive optimization. All right. Uh, let me just pull up my slides. OK, uh, can everybody see that? Oh, all right. Confirmation, great. OK, thumbs up. Uh, so yeah, for the sake of time, I'm not going to mention all the people who helped, but this is a really, really joint effort on adaptive federated optimization. Um, and this slide is going to be my most important slide if you want to take away anything from this talk. Uh, and the thing I want to emphasize is that in federated optimization, um, something that we really emphasize in this paper is that really there are two levels of optimization happening. One of them is kind of secret. Um, so this picture, we have kind of an idealized form of federated learning going on where the server has its model. It sends its model to the clients. The clients do their own local optimization. This is the optimization everybody's familiar with. You use SGD, you use whatever your favorite optimization method, maybe use a, a proximal term like in FedProx. Anyways, the clients then send their updates back to the server. But the thing that's important is that why just make the server average the model weights, right? Like instead, what you can do is have the clients send their actual gradients to the server. The server can then average all the gradients it receives and treat this as an estimate of the true gradient, quote unquote, of your loss function, and then apply your favorite optimization method. So really there's this, this hierarchical uh, optimization going on. Um, and one of them we kind of understand a little bit more, right? We know what it means to do use gradient descent on our own local data. And one of them is a little bit more mysterious. What does it mean to average all these gradients and then apply that using SGD? The thing that I want to emphasize is that this server optimization is actually really, really important. And especially it's important because of heterogeneity. Um, this plot is uh, an example of a uh, kind of realistic uh, next word prediction task. The data set is um, stack overflow posts. So all the clients are uh, different users and their data is their collection of posts. Um, and what I'm plotting here is, you know, if we run some number of uh, rounds of federated averaging, with either SGD or SGD with momentum on the server, the clients are just going to use SGD, here's what happens to the accuracy over time. And we see that there's this huge discrepancy between what SGD is doing, and that's kind of the standard Fed, av fed average, and what SGD with momentum is doing. And so this kind of begs the question, if even just a momentum on the server helps so much, uh, what about more high-powered methods? And this is kind of the core of our work. So what we do is we incorporate adaptivity into the server optimization. Um, and adaptive methods, for those unfamiliar, um, you might know them as names like Adam, Adagrad, Yogi. There's a whole bunch. Uh, and they're really, really important to the empirical success of machine learning. Um, and like I said, uh, we are going to incorporate them into the server. And this is for a couple reasons. But one of the primary ones is that this is communication efficient. If the clients were using adaptive methods, uh, there's questions of, how, what are they going to do with their optimizer states sending it to the clients, right? Like, should they send the optimizer states? Should they send this preconditioner matrix in Adagrad to the, the, the server? Um, it's not clear what the right approach is there. So we use this on the server, and then there just becomes this question, is this valid, right? We're not actually using uh, Adagrad or Atom with true gradients. We're using them with these kind of pseudo gradients that come about from averaging client updates. And we showed that this is, in fact, justified, that you can prove a robust theory about convergence uh, when you use these server optimization methods. We complement this with, uh, as Brendan mentioned in his talk today, um, a really, really large empirical study uh, that we've tried to make as open source and easy to use as possible. Um, and, our, and our goal is to really uh, provide some benchmarks for people to, to experiment with their own methods in FL. I don't have too much time, and I want to make sure that uh, Andres has time as well. So I am going to uh, basically just say that uh, you can read our paper for a full description of the algorithms if you're interested. Uh, and as far as the empirical results, uh, we see that basically on all tasks, here we have four of them outlined, uh, adaptive optimization does at least as well as non-adaptive optimization. And in particular, on the natural language processing uh, tasks, we do significantly better. Um, and at a high level, what's going on here is that adaptive methods vary the learning rate across coordinates depending on how frequently that coordinate is updated. So imagine that I'm learning an embedding layer 
for a bunch of users and you want to do natural language uh, next word prediction. If a user has very infrequently seen words, this adaptive method ensures that their words are going to get a higher learning rate. And so they are going to contribute more to the model. And so this helps with heterogeneity. It does not solve heterogeneity. It does not solve fairness. These are still really, really important topics, but it helps. Um, if you're interested, uh, please you know, uh, contact us. Go check out the code. Try to run your own experiments. We are actively updating uh, the code and trying to make it as easy to use as possible. Uh, and just one more takeaway, uh, Yogi is an adaptive method developed here at Google uh, in part. And uh, we found that federated Yogi worked uh, well across all tasks. So just some future work uh, so I can close out. Uh, adaptive federal optimization is also useful because it can be used in tandem with other areas of research. So we have people working on it with differential privacy, uh, with compression, with personalization. That's another big topic that's that's uh, coming up here. And you can use these adaptive methods to learn models that personalize well as well. And hopefully you can insert your, your own research area here. If you have an area that I haven't discussed and you're interested in adaptivity, please contact us. Um, so some open questions, maybe to spur some, some conversation. Um, how do adaptive optimization, how does that affect privacy utility trade-offs of DP? How does it affect fairness? This is a really, really interesting question I'm interested in. And the last is that um, adaptive optimizers suffer from this difficulty of hyperparameter tuning. And there's a lot of questions of how to do effective hyperparameter tuning in FL. Uh, I don't have any of the answers, but I have thoughts. So thank you. Thanks, Doug. Especially thank you for catching up the time. Uh, I guess let's do question and answer on Dory and uh, some like private communication. Let's move on to our final talk in this session. Andreas Hilberton. Okay, so um, the talk that I recorded is actually about a system called Orchard, uh, which is uh, differentially private analytics at scale, and this is joint work with a couple of people here at Penn. Um, so the problem that we're focusing on is, is uh, analytics. But we're looking at a, a, a scenario with lots and lots of devices, like think billions of devices. Right? And each of these devices, we assume, has some, some local uh, information, for instance, the words that we typed that we're trying to do predictive typing. And there's a central aggregator that wants to answer some questions about this data. And the properties that we want uh, all, all three. So first, we want privacy, especially differential privacy, meaning that the aggregator shouldn't learn the data of individual users. Um, we want high accuracy, right? So we don't want too much um, noise in, in our results, and we don't want. Uh, so we want the aggregator to be able to work directly with the users. We don't want it to need additional trusted parties uh, in the system. And so these, you know, may sound like uh, sensible domains, but you know, actually, it's it's difficult to get all three at the same time, right? So if all we care about is scalability and having just a single aggregator, we can use local differential privacy. But then we're going to get a lot of uh, noise, as we all know, right? So it's, uh, uh, it's quadratic. If we care about um, having a single aggregator and high accuracy, there are lots of uh, cool crypto techniques that you can use, um, for instance, fully homomorphic encryption, multi party computation, and so on. But these techniques uh, are difficult to scale with something like millions or billions of devices. And then finally, if we care about high accuracy and scalability, then there are all solutions like unlinks and proc load that you can use. Uh, but then we have to have additional trusted parties, for instance, and an extra shuffler in the system. So um, last year at SOSP, we, uh, we introduced a system that actually gives you all three. And that system is called Honeycrisp. And in a nutshell, what Honeycrisp does is basically it's using uh, additive homomorphic crypto to encrypt the data of the users. So you just upload this uh, encrypted data. The aggregator um, sums it all up, um, you know, and then, but they can't decrypt the, the, the results. And if you have a committee of randomly selected users that have shares of the private key, and then only they can jointly decrypt uh, the, uh, the, encrypted, uh, the encrypted data. And um, there's a lot of sort of technical details that I'm not going to get into, right? So this is uh, not as easy as it sounds. But you know, overall, it, this is a solution that works. So you might ask, well, is the problem solved? And the answer is, uh, it is solved, but only for this one particular query, right? which happens to be an important query, but it's a useful one. But it's not the only one that you want to ask. Right? So the question is, what about other queries? And there are lots of queries in the literature that people have asked about more scale data sets. You know, I'm listing a couple of them here on the slides. And the question is, can we support more of them in this, in this setting where we have like, this huge mass of users in this very distributed um, scenario? And the idea is, so, so, so we thought about this. You know, what can we do? And we realized that although these queries look very different, 
they actually have a, a sort of common core. So almost always is it the case that at the heart of this curse is some kind of sum like aggregation, like we're counting things, we're summing things, we're doing something of that order. And so the question is, can we sort of take these queries and rewrite them to expose these internal sums or aggregations? And if we can, can we then run them on something like Honeycrisp uh, and, and run them at scale? And so this is what we've been doing. We've been building a system called, uh, that we call Orchard. And actually, the system gives you the ability to take kind of queries from the literature. So I'm listing a couple on the slide. And you just throw it into the system, and it will rewrite them to be able to, to run in this distributed setting. And so you can see. You know, it works most of the time. It doesn't work all the time, because some things are just not suitable in the setting. But it does work uh, a lot of the time. So this gives you actually a lot of power, because now you have a much, a much larger range of queries that you can ask in this massively distributed setting. So I'm not going to go into how exactly that works. You know, that information is in the recorded talk. Um, I do want to say a little bit about all next steps. I was thinking about ways to make this cheaper. Right? So it's not expensive to begin with. But you know, it's always good when you have mobile devices to have a low overhead. We're thinking about attacks from adversaries. Um, they're trying to um, support even more queries. Right? So there's a couple of uh, queries that we still don't know how to do. And most of all, they're looking for interesting applications. Right? So if you have something that you think might benefit from this, and you know, if you think that you know, right now it might, not, it might not work out of the box, please do uh, come talk to me or uh, contact me at ahae at CRS. That you can do. Right? That's it. Thank you so much. And sorry about the technical problems. Thanks, Arias. We have time for one or two questions if people want to ask the year. Okay. We always do question and answer. I will bring up the slides, direct you to showing instructions on breakout session. Sure, I'll ask a question. Do you have, uh, what's, what's like the key idea for converting all these queries to, to more sum like? I agree. So the, the key idea is that um, internally, like the, the things that they're doing is already a sort of something like it's just sort of when you when you write them down as a as a centralized computation, you may not you may not say that very explicitly. Right. So what we do is essentially is we we, we rewrite those queries um, to basically group computations that you can do entirely on the client side, computations that you can do safely in the server side because the data is already um, treated went through a differentially uh, private um, noise addition. And there's some things that you have to do in, in multi-party computation, hopefully um, very few simple ones. And all the queries that we've looked at, they were fairly simple, uh, like just a couple of steps. And so that, that works out pretty well, like at least in the ones that we've looked at so far. Thank you. Thank you, Adrias, again. And uh, thank you, all the speakers in this session and all our audience for the great discussion.